and we're going to get underway. So tonight uh, we have just uh, two presenters, uh, myself, Joe Della Carpini. I'm the science and operations officer, so I manage the, uh, the science program at the office, which is research and staff training and uh, these types of, of reviews. And also with me is Hayden Frank, one of our lead meteorologists. Hayden has a lot of expertise in severe weather. He worked out at the uh, forecast office in Wichita. Uh, prior to coming to Boston uh, many years ago now, but um, Hayden uh, has a, a wealth of knowledge on severe weather. We were going to have a couple of other presenters with us tonight, but they are both in the office actually working severe weather. So unfortunately, it's just Hayden and I. Um, and as I mentioned, too, if we have time at the end, if folks want to hang around, um, we can kind of see what's going on on the radar this evening and go through a little bit, little bit of a live demo. I think that might be fun. So I'm going to start off, um, and really what we're going to do for this uh, Severe Weather 202 is go through kind of an event timeline. So we're going to start out way about four to eight days before, so maybe you know a week before the actual Severe Weather event, kind of show you what we look at um, as far as global weather models, maybe some weather patterns and severe setups that are favorable. Then as we get to about three days prior, we'll look at some of the severe weather ingredients, uh, particularly from the models that we look at and some of the other severe weather indices. Uh, by day two, so two days prior to the, the event, we're using something that are called convection allowing models. And these are models that have very high resolution. Uh, they can pinpoint uh, storms and develop storms a lot more easily than the traditional global models. Uh, so we'll discuss a little bit about how they're used and, and uh, they're actually fairly skillful. And then uh, the day, you know, the day of, we'll, we'll do some, just a quick thing on some radar interpretation. We do have another webinar coming up. Uh, on that that we'll go into more detail and talk about the process we go through with the Storm Prediction Center from the mesoscale discussions to the watches and then to the warnings that we issue. And then we're going to touch a little bit on the post-event surveys, but we'll get into more in-depth information on that for the, with the um, Southern New England Tornado webinar next week. So really in severe weather, um, there are two, two offices, you know, two, the structure is two offices essentially. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center out in Norman, Oklahoma, and they're responsible for really monitoring and forecasting the larger scale severe weather events in the US. And we're talking about essentially multi-state. So we're not talking about a few thunderstorms in Connecticut on a particular day, or even a few storms that may you know, impact a small portion of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. This, this would be on a larger scale, maybe as you see on the, the, the watch image there, from Maine down to Connecticut or New York State down through uh, Pennsylvania and into uh, maybe Maryland, something like that. But they issue um, what are called convective outlooks. These are essentially severe weather outlooks um, out to eight days in the future uh, for severe and non-severe thunderstorms. Um, as we get closer to the event, they issue what are called mesoscale discussions. And that's as the kind of as things are coming together, maybe the, on satellite, we're seeing some cloud tops building. We know there's a lot of instability and we know storms are going to form in the next few hours. So that's when they will go ahead and issue a mesoscale discussion talking about uh, maybe the, uh, the probability of a watch. You've probably have seen that. Um, and then they also coordinate the issuance of severe thunderstorm and tornado watches with weather forecast offices. So they're more of a guidance office, again, looking at large scale severe weather events, widespread severe weather events, not so much the localized um, events that can be fairly typical around here. Now, on the other side of the coin, there's the weather forecast offices like us here in Boston. So we coordinate with the SPC on which counties to include or not include in a watch. So they come out and propose a watch, um, say they, you know, they may issue one from Berkshire County in Mass and maybe all of Connecticut, all of Rhode Island, and they may leave out uh, Boston, for example. And we may think, you know what, it looks like the, the severe threat um, will extend a little farther east. So we'll have them actually add counties uh, to a watch or even remove them sometimes. Um, they'll include Cape Cod and the islands when we know it's it's fairly cool down there and then thunderstorms aren't going to make it. We'll actually remove those areas too. Um, but it's our office that actually issues the watch and will eventually clear the counties from the watch once the threat of severe weather ends. Uh, and again, as you probably know, we issue severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings, and that's based upon radar signatures or spotter reports. So the SPC um, issues outlooks, uh, which you're probably a little familiar with, using different categories. Uh, and these are largely based upon storm coverage. Uh, so, you know, most of the time around here, we'll see a marginal risk or a slight risk. Um, that doesn't mean we're not going to have severe weather, but it's, it's talking about the coverage. So uh, on a slight risk day like today, for example, the ex expectation would be for scattered severe thunderstorms, uh, maybe short lived storms, not widespread. Uh, but as you go up the scale, you can see the coverage uh, increases as well as, you know, kind of the intensity. 
So on days when we have, uh, say, you know, a moderate risk, which is fairly rare, uh, widespread severe storms are likely. Uh, they can be long-lived storms, uh, widespread and intense. Uh, so it, it, you're going up the scale, and again, it really has to do with coverage of the storm. So you know, we've we've had days certainly where we've been under a slight risk, and um, a lot of our states have been impacted. But um, on the, uh, the you know the national scale it, to the SPC, it, it still fits the definition of scattered, even though maybe locally we've got quite a, a number of storms across the area. So it's rare that you're going to see these higher end categories here in New England. Typically, we're under either marginal, slight, or enhanced. On a big day, we may be up in a moderate. Uh, that that tends to be the upper limit for us. So. The outlook um, is is really over a relatively broad area. So, uh, you know, for this slight, you know, or, or a slight risk or even you know a moderate risk on this day, um, the threat may occur in one area but not another. It's gonna, not going to cover this entire area. This is kind of outlining where the severe weather is favored. And again, it's an outlook. It's a forecast, and it's based upon the state of the atmosphere that is expected uh, during that time. So, the probability values that you will see in some of these outlooks, if you dug into them. Uh, they represent the chance of severe weather occurring within 25 miles of any given point. Uh, if you see a black hatched area that's overlaid on the probabilities, that means there's a 10% or higher probability for significant severe weather within 25 miles. And we might, what we mean by significant is listed here, a, a tornado rated EF2 or greater, um, thunderstorm wind gusts of essentially hurricane force or higher, or hail two inches or larger in diameter. Uh, so again, the, the probabilities, if you if and you can switch to those on, on the, the Storm Prediction Center page, you may, they may seem kind of low, but again, these are essentially point-based probabilities within 25 miles of any given location. So they're never really going to be much higher than you know almost a 45% is a very high um, probability for severe weather, even though it may seem rather low. So with that, I'm going to hand it on to Hayden. He's going to kind of carry the meat of this presentation, talking about model guidance as well as some of the forecasting. So Hayden, I will pass it on to you. All right. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, so everyone hears a lot about weather models, but what exactly are weather models? And uh, fortunately for Joe and myself, uh, we're not having to look at these huge, enormous equations. Just looking at that makes me dizzy. <laughs> But that is based on what the computer models are run. They're based on the laws of physics and mathematics and based on a lot of things, initial conditions, uh, resolutions, the computer model will take that initial set of conditions and extrapolate what's going to happen two days from now, four days from now, six days from now, and so on. But Think of it like this, it's adding up a bunch of numbers, two plus five plus seven plus 10. Once you make a mistake, everything after that point is going to have some degree of error. So you're basically, as you get further and further out in the forecast, uh, your odds of having uh, errors in the forecast are going to increase. And actually you can see that on the image here, um, a two meter temperature forecast, which is basically forecasting the surface temperature. Um, this was a seven day forecast from July 7th to the 14th. And you can see the uncertainty building um, as you go out in time. And, and that's the general rule of, of weather forecasting. So breaking it down, when we first start to look at a forecast, you're not going for the initial specific details. You're kind of getting an overall sense. And these are what we use are called global models. And two of the most popular models <clears throat> you may have heard on TV, uh, the GFS and the European model. Um, you know, one goes out, the European, 240 hours, which is 10 days. And then we have the GFS, which goes out 16 days. And then you see the resolution of the models. And, and not, not focusing on the specific numbers, um, but the global models tend to have a a, a smaller scale, of, well, I should say a larger scale of, of, of resolution means they're not as well defined, but they're going to give you the overall sense of the pattern. And you're initially looking, is, it, is, is the pattern favoring wet conditions? Is it favoring dry conditions? Is it favoring, you know, above normal temperatures or below normal temperatures? And then you're, as you, you process that, then you break it down more so. But we'll go into another set of global models that you may not be so much familiar with. These are the Canadian and, and youth bet models. 
Um, they're basically the same idea as the GFS and European models. Um, the model parameters, parameterization is, is slightly different. Obviously, one's, one's Canada, one's the UK. Um, but the general sense is the same in, in that you're looking at a long-term forecast, um, you know, what's going to evolve over the next three to five days, you know, going out a week, you know, a week and a half. Um, and trying to pick out the overall pattern, what type of situation are we going to look at? Um, so that's what you really are focusing in on when you're when you're say doing a forecast that's out seven days. Now, breaking it down further, as we start to get closer into time, um, we're we're looking at more what we call high resolution models, um, and what that exactly means is uh, the resolution is is greater. So basically, there's the NAM. Uh, there's a 12 kilometer NAM and a three kilometer NAM, and basically the resolution um, we're talking three kilometers and and 70 vertical levels uh, where you're looking at different fields, and they and they can be wind speed, uh, relative humidity, temperatures all throughout the atmosphere, um, and that's how you're starting to base a, a forecast for say tonight or tomorrow when we're evaluating the risk for thunderstorms and the risk for severe weather, uh, we're starting to go into the higher resolution models. Um, and this is something we didn't really have in the arsenal, even you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So uh, it's definitely added a lot of skill to the forecast. So within a specific model, um, there's something called a model ensemble. So you have whether it's a GFS model, whether it's a European model, uh, whether it's a, a NAM model, within that model, because of the, uh, there's uncertainty within the model. Obviously, you know, you don't have a ton of data out over the ocean. Um, we have upper air sites where we launch weather balloons across the country, but obviously we can't do that everywhere. Um, so the model is going to try to interpret that. And in the case of ensembles, if we tweak the initial conditions very slightly, it's not going to make a big difference, say, in the next 12 hours, but a slight tweak in the initial conditions can make a big difference in the next three, four, five, six days. Um, and this is something not only we deal with with thunderstorms, but especially with winter storms. And you can see um, this is a, a tropical forecast um, back a few years ago. And you can see you have a, a disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico. And as you go out in time, there's a large spread in the possible outcomes. Um, some refer to this as spaghetti plots. Um, but the general sense is it gives the forecaster an idea of uncertainty and tells us not to get too deterministic, especially in long ranges, leave the possibilities open and take it from there. And as we get closer in time, then we can kind of hone in on the forecast with more accuracy. So we have all these different computer models. Um, now, how do you utilize that? Well, you have to compare the models, you know, consistency, have they been consistent? Um, known biases, well, one model handles this situation better, uh, another model handles that type of situation better. I, I can tell you in, in terms of, you know, thunderstorm uh, formation, uh, we rely a lot more on the high resolution guidance, especially as we get, you know, inside say 36, inside 24 hours. In the winter time, it's a little bit different. Uh, you may have to rely more on the global models because they're kind of larger scale systems. Uh, so you have to kind of know which way to go, um, you know, depending on the situation. And, and what Joe and I, can, can tell you is what makes it quite difficult is just because one model did great with the storm or whatever two days ago doesn't mean that that model could end up being the worst model of them all with the next storm. Uh, so uh, you have to be kind of cautious not to fall into the trap. Uh, it, it's basically each event is it, it's on its own. They have models have their own uh, biases and, and you know how to kind of manipulate which one in a certain situation. Um, but again, nothing just because one model did great in this storm doesn't mean the next storm it's going to do as well. So 
Another thing that's really important uh, when we're forecasting thunderstorms and potential severe weather are model soundings. Uh, so a lot of those fields that um, you look at where you see the you know, map of North America and, and different fields, you're looking at a specific level. But when we go to model soundings, we're actually looking up at, at a specific point, but looking at it, say, up through the atmosphere, not just at one level. And that's really important. Um, so we may be looking at a point, this would be a, a sounding from Norman, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, in, in the red would be the temperature, and, and on the green would be the dew point. And you know, looking at different things, and we'll talk about as we go, go through this, the amount of stability there is, instability, um, and we'll talk about what we call forcing, um, that's kind of a mechanism for thunderstorm development. So uh, we'll go into greater depth here in a little bit. So the big thing for a severe thunderstorm is you need a bunch of ingredients to come together. And it's kind of like building a cake or making a cake, I should say. If one of the ingredients is missing, it, it's not going to happen. Um, so this kind of really sums things up quite nicely. You, re you really need four things, moisture, instability, lift, and shear. Well, moisture is not really a problem for us given our proximity to the ocean. Uh, lift isn't usually either a problem too. You have a cold front. Um, basically, cold air, think of it as more dense than warm air. Um, it's kind of like in, when you're um, heating your home, house in the wintertime. If you go up to the attic, it's usually the hottest up there, right? Because that warm air is less dense, it rises. Well, cold air undercuts it. So it forces that warm air up, you get clouds, and if the conditions are right, you get thunderstorms. And lastly, instability on, on the bottom left there. The way you wanna picture it is you wanna make the ground as warm and moist as possible. And as you go up in the atmosphere, say, 30,000 feet, 35,000 feet where airplanes fly, you want to be as cold as possible. That increases your instability. And there is something called shear. Um, that's wind changing directions with height. Um, and there's something just as important. It's called speed shear. Uh, for severe weather, you want winds to increase significantly with height. If the winds are weak, say where airplanes at airplane level, um, that's usually not conducive for severe weather. So four to eight days ahead, when you're forecasting this time of year, obviously we're not dealing with snowstorms right now. So we're, we're focusing on something called the dew point. And that's actually the amount of moisture available or looking at the precipital water, the total atmospheric water vapor in a column of air from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. Um, so, in order to get thunderstorms, you need to have that moisture increase. If it's, if it's, you know, you start to get in those muggy days, um, that's where your threat of thunderstorms increases, but that's not it. You're just not going to get thunderstorms if you're humid. We plenty of days where we're humid and dry, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But tracking moisture from the sounding, um, one of the things that's also important is where does it fall within the climatology? Um, and this is something we real, really utilize here. So this would be uh, different soundings for Chatham on the right um, and, the, and the precipitable water. And you can see as you go from January through July, obviously the average moisture is going to be increasing. Um, and you have the, the, the black line there, which indicates the median, how far above or below you are of that is going to give you an indication. Obviously, if you're, say, you know, in the top 10%, you know, your P watts, or as we say, precipital water values um, are close to two or, or higher, um, that gives you an idea that the atmosphere is what we term as juiced. So it's ready to go if there is a trigger. Um, and that, that's the next point we'll have to discuss here. So instability is what we need. Temperature inversions prevent upward motion. And the best way to, exam to, to kind of picture this is when you wake up in, a, in the middle of January and it's five degrees and you don't want to get up and you see the 
chimney smoke rising from your neighbor's house, but it, it kind of hits a level and just goes straight. It doesn't rise anymore. It's actually because overnight the ground cooled and it's warmer above it. So that air cannot rise anymore. It's capped. Okay, but once you start to heat the ground, say mid to late morning into the afternoon, the ground becomes warmer than the air above it. So that air can now rise freely. So that's one of the big things that needs to be over, overcome for thunderstorms, severe weather is overcoming that cap. And instability, uh, one thing you may hear us refer to if, if you read our area forecast discussions is something called CAPE. It's convective available potential energy. And the more energy that's available for storms, they can grow stronger. And that means they can grow higher and higher. We call refer to as updrafts, winds going up into the storm. Believe it or not, um, you know, I used to do some storm chasing and in a, in a robust thunderstorm, you can have winds going from the surface basically up into the cloud of over 100 miles per hour where you can't even open your car door if you're underneath the updraft. So that's how strong these things can be. Uh, but the larger the cape, um, the stronger the updraft potential is and the stronger the potential for the thunderstorm is. Now, stability, there's something called convective inhibition, SIN, um, and it's a measure of capping. Um, it's something that we examine because the more that we say sin is available, the less chance of thunderstorms. Even if you have a high amount of cape, you can have extraordinary amounts of cape. They do, you know, pretty much every day in the summer uh, in the, in this, you know, southern plains, the southeast. Um, but if you have that convective inhibition, that warm cap above, you're not going to realize that. So there won't be any thunderstorms. It'll just be hot and humid. You have to have something to overcome that convective inhibition, some type of front, something like that. So this would be an example of looking at a sounding here. And um, basically, you're kind of lifting. Once you, you cool that air, um, you lift it. And in that reddish shading is the amount of instability. So this is a sounding from Springfield, um, which indicates a pretty uh, robust amount of instability. Um, but notice the temperature profile going down at the surface. Um, it actually rises uh, until you get to, um, you know, several thousand feet off the ground and then it starts to fall. But you cannot, until you erode that warm layer, say, and we, we'd refer to this at like, say, 800 millibars, you're not going to be able to generate thunderstorms, no matter how much instability you have. So um, that's something important to keep in mind. It's not all about the instability. You need to break the sin, um, and that's usually done with some type of frontal boundary or some type of energy to do that. So tracking instability and lapse rates. Um, this is kind of what I mentioned at the beginning. A lapse rate is the rate of temperature change with height. So the faster the temperature decreases with height, the steeper the lapse rate and the more unstable the atmosphere becomes. So again, you want the, if you want thunderstorms, you want the ground to be as warm as possible and you want say 20, 30,000 feet to be as cold as possible. Um, I, I should also mention, well, how can you get thunderstorms when it's 40 degrees? Well, you may be stable at the ground, but if you're lifting, say, from 5,000 feet to 30,000 feet, that area may be very unstable. So the thunderstorms may not be based at the surface, but they can still be pretty strong if they're based from 5,000 feet upwards. So when we talk about lift, and again, this is what we're usually focused on in, in order to have forcing so that instability can be realized. Well, most of the time in, in Southern New England, um, we are going to be talking about a cold front that's going to be um, forcing that warm air to rise up. You get clouds and if conditions are right, you have enough instability like we do right now in Western Massachusetts, you're going to get thunderstorms developing. 
Um, you can get it on a warm front. That happens too. Uh, usually warm fronts, they're what we call um, elevated thunderstorms. What I kind of just talked about where the thunderstorms aren't surface-based, so it can still be cool at the surface. Um, let's say five, 10,000 feet up to say 30,000 feet up, it can be very unstable. Uh, one other thing I should mention in the, in the bottom left here is something called the dry line. Uh, those are, you hear a lot about in the plains and basically it separates that hot desert air um, coming off say Nevada and that area from you know the tropical moisture coming off the Gulf of Mexico. So you can have a, you know, tremendous moisture gradients and um, those are really ripe for tornadoes. That's one of the reasons why the, the Midwest gets so many tornadoes. So tracking lift, well, you know, it, it's actually not that complex. You're basically looking at which way the atmosphere, you know, things are coming from in the atmosphere. You know, a lot of times uh, things are coming from say west to east. Um, you know, back before they had um, computer models, um, a lot of forecasters will kind of look at what happened, say, um, over the Great Lakes or Michigan. That was uh, one of the inklings from the, you know, big Worcester tornado of June 9th, 1953. Forecasters in, in Boston actually did have an idea of there could be significant severe weather based on um, the tornado outbreak they had the day before in Michigan. So uh, some of that still applies today. Obviously, we have a lot more uh, technology available, but knowing where things are coming from, uh, what's happened out, you know, over the last couple of days from the same weather system uh, can certainly help in, in the forecast process. So one thing we want to talk about is wind shear. In addition to the uh, instability uh, you need wind shear. And um, one of the things we talk about is first directional and speed shear. They're, they're two different things. Uh, wind, I'll start with the one on the right, the speed shear. Uh, basically, that's winds increasing with height. Um, that's very important for thunderstorm development because in thunderstorms, you have something called the updraft, which is the wind going up into the thunderstorm, and then the downdraft, which is the rain, wind, and hail. Now, if you don't have strong enough winds aloft, what happens is the downdraft collapses right on top of the updraft. If you have strong winds aloft, you get that separation between the updraft and the downdraft, and the downdraft is no longer collapsing right on top of the updraft, so thunderstorms can live longer and grow stronger. Another thing on the left here is something called directional shear. Uh, this is winds changing direction with height. This is what we really, really focus on when we think there's a risk for tornadoes, that uh, directional shear. Um, so both are integral parts of, of forecasting severe weather. So tracking wind shear is something called the um, SBC mesoanalysis, um, looking at the zero to six kilometer shear. Um, what's, a, what's a good amount of shear? Well you know, generally 40 to 70 knots is good. Um, this time of year, you know, because you have more instability, you can compensate for less shear. You may only have 25, 30, 35 knots, but you can kind of get away with it because your instability is stronger. And then we go talk about something called zero to one kilometer shear. Um, that's really down low. And that's what we're really talking about when we're looking for potential tornadoes are really focused in on uh, that low level turning that's going to that's that directional turning um, and that's important for tornado development so uh, again using the SPC mesoanalysis storm relative helicity um, that's something we really value it's the measure of the potential for cyclonic updraft rotation so larger values of zero to three kilometer storm relative helicity and zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity suggest an increased threat of tornadoes uh, with supercell. Uh, we're normally looking at values ex of that zero to one kilometer helicity, storm relative helicity, I should say, exceeding 100. Um, that gets us concerned if we have instability. And tracking shear with the models. So, um, 
there's a couple ways to do this. You can actually look at the sounding and see the wind direction changing with height um, right over there. And you can plot it on a hodograph, um, which is plotting the different wind directions at different levels. And this will tell you what your what your hode graphs looking at. Do you have, you know, are are your do you have big turning in the atmosphere? Do you have enough speed shear? Um, so that's definitely another way of uh, looking at it. So whatever way you you go about it, um, that turning of the winds and the speed shear is very important. And this is just an example of of plotting the winds on a hodograph. So basically, as we're going, you know, from left to right here, um, you know, we're plotting the wind direction. Um, and as we're going up in altitude, the speeds are obviously increasing um, and the direction's changing. Um, so that's what you're looking for um, when you're forecasting the potential for tornadoes or even severe weather itself, even if you don't have the turning, if, if you have, you know, strong wind shear, a strong speed here, I should say, um, that's enough to get really organized severe weather. So one of the things that I really like to look at is, is not just focus on cape or not just focus on shear uh, because you need both of them. So looking for different parameters where they overlap. And one of them is called the supercell composite parameter. So this includes effective storm relative velocity, uh, most unstable cape, uh, effective bulk wind difference, um, and larger values indicate where the great greatest overlap is. So that's really important in diagnosing severe weather. And there's something called the significant tornado parameter, um, STP for short. Um, it's we're looking at the zero to six kilometer bulk wind difference, and then we're going down low, looking at the zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity. We're looking at CAPE. Um, we're looking at LCL heights, and, and that means when you have low spreads between the temperature and dew points, your LCLs are low, which gives you an increased chance for tornadoes. And again, this is just a parameter that's going to highlight where the risk is, it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it could give you an uh, indication on the possibility. And as we talked about earlier, um, convective allowing models, usually one to two days ahead, these are known as high resolution models. Um, they can kind of try to resolve individual storms. Um, a lot of times you, you can use an, an ensemble um, or a simulated radar. Uh, but what they'll kind of highlight, and you may see a lot of these on TV, uh, sometimes we'll, we'll post these on our social media sites just to kind of give an indication of, of what things might look like, but it kind of give you an idea of what the storms may look like, whether you have individual storms or whether it tends to form a line of storms, uh, the timing, whether they're expected to weaken or whether they're expected to strengthen. So uh, it, it gives you an idea, again, it's it's not to be taken you know, verbatim, but kind of gives forecasters an indication of what might transpire. And as we get into the really, really short term, you know, inside um, 18 hours, um, and sometimes we'll, every six hours, it'll go out 36 hours, um, something called the high resolution rapid refresh, uh, better known as the HRRR model. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different fields that you can look at. Um, you can look at, you know, reflectivity, um, you know, where the strongest storms are, um, how much rainfall is forecast, um, and this is being run every hour. So uh, you can see quite the variation from run to run. Sometimes you look at the overall ensemble of, the, of this model to kind of give you a better idea, um, but it's just another tool in the arsenal. And uh, one of the things we really like to look at is something called the HREF High Resolution Ensemble Forecasts. And this puts together a lot of those uh, CAM models, the high resolution models, and creates a, uh, an ensemble with them. And the resolution uh, is three kilometers, you know, approximately two miles, which is, you know, you know, pretty good. And it will give an indication of where the storms are gonna form. You can do a, a radar imagery of 
things are gonna look like over the next 48 hours. Uh, so it can really give you an idea what the severe weather potential is, say tonight, those storms out in Western Mass, are they gonna hold together? Or are they gonna weaken as they come into Eastern Mass? You know, what about tomorrow? How, how are things going to unfold? Um, and there's a lot of different fields uh, that we look at and you can kind of put where instability and shear overlap. So a lot of, lot of good stuff in there. And uh, another um, thing we look at is something called the SHREF, Short Range Ensemble Forecast. Uh, again, this is more of an, an ensemble to hire, to iron out uncertainty. Um, and this is a, a thing I like to use. We talked about um, instability and, and shear overlapping. Well, here we have, uh, this is the probability for CAPE over 1,000 and um, shear um, over 40 knots, bulk effective shear. I think this was from June 6th. That was a, a pretty good severe weather outbreak in Eastern Mass and Rhode Island, that area. And you can see, well, where's the area highlighted? That's where we have the greatest overlap of instability and shear. Um, so it doesn't always work out perfectly, but it's going to get you usually into the ballpark of where areas you should be most concerned about. And lastly, um, something that we you know recently began to use um, statistical severe convective risk assessment model I know that's a lot of words there um, but it's basically taking um, the initial conditions in the environment and utilizing the HRR model and then going back and taking a, a model climatology of those same conditions and what's happened before and given a, a a risk assessment of what the probability of, say, wind is, damaging winds, uh, hail, or tornadoes. Again, the probabilities may be relatively low, but that's because we're at a specific point. But it, I don't, not focusing on the specific probabilities, but just where the gradients are. And uh, this has been a, a very useful tool, especially, especially in the near term. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe uh, to wrap things up here. Okay, thanks Aiden and uh, great job. So now we're getting into the day of the severe weather event and um, it's time for our uh, interaction with the Storm Prediction Center. So uh, prior to issuing a watch, um, typically you'll see the mesoscale discussion come out. I'm sure many of you are familiar with those. It gives a general uh, idea of what's going on, what's expected, and usually you'll see a probability of a watch. Well. If it gets to the point where the Storm Prediction Center thinks a watch is warranted, and again, this is typically for larger areas, multi-state, um, covering more than one forecast office, um, they will initiate a conference call with the affected offices. So in this case here, uh, they would have discussed the watch with our office in, in Norton um, and also with the office in Gray, Maine, and probably a couple of the neighboring offices too, um, Burlington, Vermont, and probably Albany, New York. And we'll have a phone conference, you know, usually just a few minutes. They'll discuss what's going on and what their expectations are. Uh, and then we'll, uh, you know, give our feedback if we agree, if there's something we disagree about, um, or if there's a change to the watch that, that we would like, um, we go ahead and recommend that. Uh, so at that point, um, you know, we have our coordination. And then typically a few minutes after that, the watch is issued. And at that point, uh, the watch is owned by the forecast office. So. Uh, as severe weather clears, say, Western Massachusetts and Connecticut, it's up to our office in Norton to clear these counties from the watch, um, telling them severe weather, the threat of severe weather has ended, say, in Hartford, Springfield, uh, and Greenfield. And then the day of the severe event, um, we're getting, you know, into uh, the warning mode. So you see on, on the left, a radar loop with some warning polygons. Um, we'll get into a lot more of this in our radar interpretation webinar, um, which will be coming in a few weeks. And again, this is the mesoscale discussion. Uh, you may see one actually during the time of the watch as well, kind of as an update. Um, they hi highlight areas that are expected to see uh, maybe the greatest risk of severe weather and why. So they kind of will hatch an area within the watch to show where the greatest threat will be for the next couple of hours. We also um, use observations. Um, and this is a basic uh, plot of, of weather stations around the area maybe a little bit familiar with this from uh, Weather 101, but um, if not, it, basically what it is is just a plot of the weather at a given location. So uh, let's use, for example, Boston. Um, the, the top number on the left is the temperature, 82. The dew point is on the lower left, 68. And then uh, this 
these barbs give you wind direction and speed. So it's where the wind is coming from. Uh, think of a compass. So this is southwest. Uh, this is west over here in this area. Uh, and the, the little barbs on it are also speed. So a full barb is 10 knots or about 12 miles per hour. And a shorter barb is about uh, five knots or maybe six miles per hour. So you kind of add the two together. This is 15 knots, 10 knots uh, as an example. So it's a quick way to kind of see what's going on. And in this case, you know, we're looking at the at the weather plots to see that we have moisture in this case. And I would say, yes, the dew points are in the low 70s in Connecticut. And a southwest wind is probably going to bring those up into parts of Rhode Island and Massachusetts. We also, as Hayden mentioned, we, you know, we look at our, we look at basic weather maps too. Um, do we have a source of lift? Yes. In this case, we had a cold front um, entering the area, which would provide our source of lifting that warm, moist air to help produce thunderstorms. Now, after the severe event, um, sometimes we do storm surveys. Um, it's not done for every single event or, uh, you know, in particular, but typically it's, it's for two things, suspected tornado damage or substantial wind damage, say wind damage that uh, cause quite a bit of maybe damage to buildings, um, widespread tree damage where uh, the winds were probably greater than 80 miles per hour. We need to document that um, kind of for the climate and historical records. So um, same, same with tornadoes. So if there's strong indications, either sometimes it's on radar, um, sometimes it's from spotters, and sometimes it's from photos of damage that we see, we will actually go out and conduct a storm survey. Um, in a typical summer, our office, you know, we'll do a handful of them, maybe two, three, um, back, I think, Hayden, in 2018, when we had all the tornadoes, we were doing them once a week. It was quite a bit. Um, but we actually go out and take a look at the damage. Um, will we determine, you know, is it a tornado? Uh, well, it depends on the damage pattern. So, um, you know, tornado damage will have a chaotic appearance, uh, large uprooted trees, uh, kind of a convergent pattern a lot of times. Um, but... It's hard to tell sometimes with the weaker EF0 tornadoes because it can be similar to uh, that from, from wind damage. Sometimes it's a very subtle signature. So we go out to survey that using the, the information we see based on, from the damage, um, talking to eyewitnesses. Did anybody see anything? Sometimes they see swirling debris. Uh, in some cases with tornadoes, uh, we've seen uh, eyewitnesses have reported water being sucked out of a lake um, or out of the water. Uh, or, you know, and, and the third part is the radar data back at the office. So we kind of put all the pieces of the puzzle together um, before coming up with our conclusion. And again, we'll get into a lot more of this in our, in our tornado webinar next week. But here's a quick bird's eye view of what some damage might look like in the difference. So this is in Munson, Mass, uh, the June 1st uh, tornado. Uh, it was a high-end EF3. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of chaotic damage here to these fallen trees. And you can probably almost make out a path through the middle. Um, it's almost it's fairly convergent. Whereas on the right, this was from Western Mass this past May. Um, this is an example of straight line wind from what's called a microburst, which is a, out, a, a rushing out of the uh, the air from a thunderstorm. So the damage is all pretty much in one direction. So you can definitely see the difference between the two. And um, now in nowadays we have drone footage, which is very helpful. Um, in some cases, like the the, the June 2011 tornadoes, we had. Um, footage from the state police, Massachusetts State Police, and the um, Civil Air Patrol. Uh, so we have aerial footage that helps quite a bit. But also, you know, having those boots on the ground and, and having us get out and survey the damage is, is really important to get these surveys done correctly. So after the event, we then rate the tornado. Um, and typically what we look at are what are called damage degree indicators. These are used to estimate wind speed. And in turn, the wind speed estimate that we come up with drives the uh, rating on the EF scale. So um, again, the storm survey is taking into account observed damage on the survey, eyewitness reports, as well as radar data. And we will actually walk you through uh, a storm survey in next week's uh, tornado webinar. So I hope you can join us for that or catch it on YouTube afterwards. And after all the reports are submitted, um, you may have seen what are called local storm reports that are issued during uh, showing where the damage is. These are collected by the Storm Prediction Center. And the next day, or you can go back in the archives, you can find out uh, the severe weather reports that occurred on any given day uh, throughout the United States. So if you want more about forecasting, um, this is a really good site. And I, I encourage uh, you to go through some of these web-based modules, especially if you know perhaps someone who's in high school, who's a, an aspiring meteorologist, or even someone in college, uh, or just if you have an interest. Um, 
there's a place called the Warning Decision Training Division. It's part of the National Weather Service, and they actually uh, do a lot of our training uh, here that we take here at the office uh, seasonally. So there's, if you go to this web link, and I have a whole list of web links coming up at the end, it's training.weather.gov slash WDTD. That'll take you to their homepage. You go to the top menu, which is main courses, and go to a thing called the warning operations course, and that will take you to a number of different courses. I have a, what's called the severe track highlighted here. There's also a winter weather track, a flash flood track, um, and then click on course information. That will take you to the page, and there's a bunch of drop down menus. So for the severe weather track, there's a one section on, called convective fundamentals, and that talks a lot about what Hayden went through tonight lifting mechanisms, uh, light, even goes into lightning, effective use of convection, convective allowing models, our CAMs, uh, and then there's other drop-down menus, training on tornadoes, hail, what are called a QLCS, that's essentially a squall line, um, things on, on warnings that we issue. So these are all web-based modules that you can do on your own at home. Uh, they're all short modules, 10 to 15 minutes tops, uh, and they're really, really good source of training. So Again, if you have an interest, or if, especially if you know a student or somebody who's interested in meteorology, this will really get them on the fast track to learning about different topics in meteorology. So it's the Warning Decision Training Division, the same place that produces the training that I assign uh, to our staff here in Norton. So with that, we're gonna end, and I'm gonna leave this uh, page up uh, with web links, uh, starting with our page, but also some of the ones that we've shown, um, including Storm Prediction Center, the Weather Prediction Center, Here's the mesoanalysis page, the SREF, the HREF, the SCRAM, as we call it, uh, is good. Model data, uh, also this is a good site. The uh, College of DuPage has, has a lot of good model data, easy to navigate, easy to read. Uh, the GO-16 satellite imagery, we didn't really show much of that, but um, this is a nice place to, to look at some satellite loops and different color curves. And again, the warning decision training division page is there. So um, I will leave that up. And at this point, Hayden and I will entertain some questions. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot. We actually had a very high number of people attending tonight, which is fantastic. So we appreciate it. Uh, so let's start off, and I'm going to pass some of these to Hayden because he's my severe weather guy. Uh, so Hayden, the first one's from Eric. Do the Worcester Hills and the city of Worcester cause thunderstorms to weaken or fall apart? I have witnessed many times storms falling apart and then regrouping on the other side of the city. And this is a common question we've had. So Hayden, what you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, sure, Joe. Um, yeah, there's definitely some there's definitely some truth to that in the sense that you know as you're going, um, say down in elevation, there's a, a little bit of a what we call down slope uh, where the air is, tends to dry out a little bit, so there can be some weakening, and then things can tend to reorganize um, as as you get beyond that. Um, in Massachusetts, you know, we, we're not dealing with you know significant terrain issues. Uh, compared to say the western part of the country, um, you know we're generally talking about you know 1,500 feet. It, it it can make a difference. Um, there's also some interesting things that can happen in the Connecticut River Valley, um, where you're you know east east of the terrain there, the higher you know the Berks, where um, your surface winds can turn more southeasterly, uh, which has been shown to perhaps result in an increase in tornado risk uh, for that area. Uh, so it, it can work both ways. Um, I find like sometimes, you know, if, if someone is into weather and wants thunderstorms, uh, the natural instinct is say, they always weaken as they approach me. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think there's some truth to, to both sides. And overall, given that the terrain somewhat limited here, the, the bigger factor is going to be um, is the instability decreasing or increasing as 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 storms are approaching a certain area? That's definitely going to have a, you know, more of a factor. Or is the the wind field wind shear increasing or decreasing, as, as opposed to the terrain? But the terrain is a is a bit of a factor too. Okay, good question, Eric. Next one is from Mark. Um, how is the dew point calculated? And uh, I can take that one, Hayden. So. Uh, the dew point is, so it's the temperature at which the air would be saturated. So you have to remember that. So um, before, you know, essentially automated weather stations, uh, they, they, they will calculate it. But um, there's essentially two temperatures that are measured. 
Um, and back in the old days when we used to take weather observations at airports, uh, we actually did this manually. So you'd have two thermometers. One was called the dry bulb thermometer, which was just a typical thermometer. And you had another thermometer, which was called the wet bulb thermometer. And you would take a piece of cloth, essentially, that was moist, and it would be attached to the um, end of the, the tip of the thermometer. So you would read the two temperatures. You'd have a dry bulb temperature and a wet bulb temperature. And from that, you would go ahead and calculate the dew point. Nowadays, we have um, automated weather stations at our airports, and most people have a home weather station. So it's, it's computed kind of on the fly calculated. There's no actual thermometer. It's a sensor um, that can calculate both. But good question. So dew point is actually from the combination of dry bulb and what's called the wet bulb temperature. So there's a piece of trivia that you can amaze your friends with. Uh, question from Peter. How does the Showalter index work? Hayden, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so basically, the Showalter index is measuring um, elevated instability. Uh, so we talked about in 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 terms of well, how do you get thunderstorms when it's forty degrees out? Uh, we actually had a, a situation like that where we had some fairly large hail uh, in mid March. I think almost golf ball size uh, across central Massachusetts, and the Showalter is usually going to say take the uh, instability from like 5,000 feet up in, in the atmosphere, you know, all the way up as opposed to the surface. So uh, you may have what we call that inversion, that cool uh, low level air, um, say at ground level, um, but your thunderstorms aren't being triggered at that level. So if you actually looked at surface instability, surface Kate, uh, you get a value of zero. But if you actually looked at the value above that inversion, say at four or 5,000 feet, um, then you'd see, you could have say a thousand joules of Cape. So um, the Showalter Indice is, is looking at moisture and it's looking at instability, but not at the ground. It's looking at it further up into the atmosphere. Okay, good one. All right, a question from John. This is about lightning. Have the conditions in thunderstorms that produce lightning colliding ice crystals have been recreated in a lab to produce the same result? Uh, lightning or static electricity. And um, Hayden, I believe in the labs, yeah, they, I mean, they can produce, you know, kind of simulated lightning. Um, it's done more with an electric current and electric charge as opposed to actual ice crystals. I'm not sure if that's ever been done in a lab setting. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly wouldn't know specifically, but I, the way you mentioned it, Joe, I think that's typically, um, you know, how they, how they recreate it. Um, but obviously it's, it's, something that is hard to do and uh you know simulate yeah, a real situation ice but, crystals and that small like in a lab setting would be very difficult you really have to be in the atmosphere and you know thousands of feet in depth i think in order to get it to work um, but good question john that, that's that'd be fun to try sometime i guess uh question from katie and hayden you may know you're you're the guy who remembers everything when were the last times we were in a moderate, enhanced, or high risk? And actually, have we ever been in a high risk day, especially since this new five-step scale was implemented? I can remember moderate and enhanced. I don't know if we've ever been in a high, Aiden. Do you recall I, any? I, well, I believe, I think maybe, I'm not 100% sure, um, was it the end of May, May of 98? Um, I think that we might have been in a high risk for that event, at least part of our area. Um, I, I believe it was um, May 31st of 1998 um, that we, parts of New England were in a high risk. Um, I was, so it's, it's I'm not 100%. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that was a, that May 31st, 1998 um, was a big event. I, I, I yeah. think we were in a high risk. I think parts of our area were in a high risk. Yeah, I, I don't remember any other than that. Um, you know, enhanced, we've been in a couple of those in, within this year, uh, moderate occasionally too. But yeah, high is, high is rare around here, definitely. Okay, let's see. A uh, comment from Joe, the euro is 14 kilometers for the... EPS, which is the ensemble, instead of 16 kilometers. Um, I don't know. Did you mention? Oh, maybe it was mislabeled on that. That's possible. So thanks for the clarification, Joe. I know it was recently changed, too. Uh, question from Catherine. What is the level of free convection in CAPE, and how does that work? 
Did you like that one, Hayden? I mean, it's yeah. I um, I think I, I'm not exactly sure what the uh, detail of the question is, but in in terms of where I, I think she's asking where you're able to generate convection. Is, is that yeah i think maybe? so yeah i mean that's essentially where you can get the, the air parcel to rise um so yeah what, what is it in cape it's i mean it's not directly related um but it's where the air parcel can tap into that energy essentially if that makes sense so there's different le you know the, the level of free convection is where the the air parcel you know is becomes to the point where it can rise essentially it's nothing keeping it suppressed or down, you know, like an inversion, for example. So I think that's, yeah, what, so, I think that's what she was asking. Yeah. So then, you, you know, it, I think it, it goes back to, you know, having the atmosphere, you know, it, a loft as cold as you can get it and as warm you get it at the surface, then you're going, you're going to steepen those lapse rates. Right. And the, the steeper the lapse rates are, you know, the more convection the atmosphere is prone to. Okay, that was a good question. Question from John, is the concept of an updraft getting knocked down by shear a myth? Is this just a result of a low cape, high shear environment? Good question, John. Want to tackle yeah, that so, one? Go ahead. Yeah, um, there's some talk if, if basically you could have, if you don't have enough cape that you would have too much shear and um, the updrafts will be uh ripped apart um you know i think it all depends on on the environment i mean i there's a lot of cases early season cases um in the southeast united states where you have just tremendous amounts of shear um you know in terms of values could be 80 90 you know, a hundred knots and, you know, your, your instability could be, you know, just several hundred joules a cave and you can end up with tornadoes. And so, um, you know, I, I, that, that can be, I think an issue if things are breaking out well ahead of say a frontal boundaries as that, um, storms start to outrun the forcing, but if the forcing's strong enough, um, I, I, don't think that really comes into play. The forcing, if there's enough instability, um, you know, that shear is actually going to be, you know, very positive uh, for thunderstorm development. Now, if you get further away from uh, the actual front or boundary, then I think that may come into play. Okay. All right. Next question is from Peter. Does New England get MCSs or MCCs? Oh, getting a little technical. I like that. Um, well, uh, yes. Um, an MCC is actually a type of MCS, if you want to put it that way. Uh, so MCS is a mesoscale convective system, and it covers a lot of different types of storms. Um, it can be things like a, a small squall line or, or things like that. An MCC is a mesoscale convective complex, which is, the, which is a larger complex of thunderstorms. We see a lot of them in the Midwest. Um, I'm sure Hayden's been through quite a few of them when he was out in Wichita. Uh, so we, you know, we have seen these larger complexes move through New England. It's, I would say it's probably more rare. Um, we, MCSs describe a wide variety of, of thunderstorm systems. So I would say we get more in the way of an MCS as opposed to a specific um, convective complex. Hayden, is there anything to add on that? No, I, I think you hit the nail okay. right on the head, yeah. I, <laughs> I remember yeah, learning, and, you know, and I remember learning that one in college. An MCC is an MCS, but not the other way around. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question from John: How do you determine when to issue a severe thunderstorm warning? Uh, Hayden, you can grab that one. Yeah. Well, if, if someone can tell me the exact uh, thresholds, <laughs> I, I'd be uh, happy to learn. Um, you know, it, it's like it, it, it's difficult sometimes. Sometimes it, it, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Um, I, I think we we all as forecasters would say the the marginal situations are are the, the most difficult. Um, a lot of times, you know, as a radar operator, you're looking at how high the core aloft is, um, reflectivity core, the higher that is, say, above the freezing level, especially if you have a 65 or, or higher DBZ core above the freezing level, um, that's a good indication. Uh, but you don't always need that. Um, a lot of times we're looking at 
the velocity data? Do you have strong winds going towards the radar, or away from the radar? Um, that really um, kind of hones in. You're looking at the environment, the amount of instability. Uh, so there's a there's a lot of things you're looking at. Um, but I'd say you know how high the in, the cores are going up, what the winds uh, on the radar look like, and and the environment. They're they're all all key players. All right. A uh, question from Eric. How do El Nino and La Nina affect the occurrence and or severity of severe weather outbreaks across the U.S.? Ooh, that's a good one. Are you aware of any correlation, Hayden? Yeah, um, there, there, there might be some subtle correlation. Um, you have like a, a more, you know, subtropical jet stream in, in like an El Nino that may somewhat increased risks as you get later into the season. Um, but there's there's so many moving parts. Um, it's it's really, you know, difficult to, you know, really pin down in areas, you know, early on, if you have a, you know, big subtropical, you know, jet, like you, you may in El Nino and, and big systems moving across the south, um, east, you, you can get, you know, tornadoes with limited instability. Um, so there, it, it, it can increase the subtropical jet, um, and that can increase your, your wind shear and, um, you know, can lead to more tornadoes. But again, there's, there's a lot of moving parts to that. Yep. Okay. A uh, question from Samuel, are squall lines and derechos harder to forecast than tornadoes? Um, I would say, I mean, squall lines, typically the models do pretty well showing the potential. Uh, the duration is a much longer lived feature. Uh, not always forecast so well by the models. Um, you know, tornadoes on the other hand, it's take your pick. Um, you know, I would say, you know, we know the environments for tornadoes, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more next week's uh, webinar. Um, you know, typically we we see more in the way of squall lines here. Duratios are fairly rare. Um, Hayden, I don't know, have you any any comments in your, from you? Yeah, I mean, duratios. Um... Uh, in New England, we we don't we don't see too many. I mean, we get them um, once in a while. I, I know there was there's a pretty good duration um, about a month and a half ago uh, in the you know Philly, New Jersey area, uh, and they don't get them too often. Um, but duration is defined as a you know pretty large swath of you know damaging winds. Um, so we get them once in a once in a while, uh, but fortunately not too often. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to keep going through all these questions. So I know we're a little bit past an hour, but if you want to stay with us, uh, please, you know, we'll, we'll get to them all. Uh, from question from Robert, this is more of a career question, but do all NWS personnel need to be good at programming? Uh, no, not really. Um, I'm not a programmer. I don't think Hayden is much of a programmer, yeah. um, but we do have several. On our staff. Yeah, we have several on our staff who actually are good programmers. So, uh, you know, not a requirement. Uh, it's a nice to have, uh, it certainly can, you know, help, but uh, no, it's not a not a requirement. You just basic uh, computer system knowledge, which is a lot of on the job training. So, good question. Uh, question from Henry: What are your general thoughts on the severe threat tomorrow for eastern the eastern part of southern New England? Did you look at anything, Hayden? I did look at, at okay. some things. I think I, I think um, you know tomorrow has um, a, a better better chance. Um, you know, across a, a larger area of uh, southern New England than. Um, this evening, I know there were. It looks like there's a few reports of uh, wind damage that occurred out in uh, Western Massachusetts um, a little after. It looks like a little after seven o'clock here. Yeah. Um, but I think um, the instability is a, is a lot more um, in the, in Eastern Mass than it was today. So I think there'll there'll be a, a larger area that'll have a potential impact. All right. So then the advice is, folks, stay weather aware tomorrow and uh, stay. I, I'm sure all of you will stay in tune with the latest info. A uh, question from Colin. This is a good one. How do thunderstorms interact with the water? Meaning in the earlier part of summer, I've noticed that strong storms over the land can sometimes fall apart when they reach the coast. How does water temperature affect this? I guess I can take that one. That's uh, so it does. Yeah, actually, the cooler water does. Well, what does it do? It cuts off the instability, and that that's one of the ingredients we need for the thunderstorm. So earlier in the summer, the water temperatures are still relatively cool. You know, 60s for the most part. 
Um, so that'll tend to kind of kill off the storms. And usually once you see them get a, a nice line of storms is coming in from say, Eastern New York, it goes, it gets to Albany and everyone, you know, Boston, the Providence and the Cape is thinking, oh good, my lawn's gonna get watered and what happens, it falls apart. Uh, later in the summer, the water temperatures get warmer, so it's less of an issue. Um, but you're right, Colin, usually it's earlier in the summer, the storms will tend to fall apart, unless there's some sort of you know, strong forcing, like a strong cold front that can really help drive the, uh, the storms all the way to the coast. But that's typically what happens. Uh, question from Kevin. I was wondering, how do some severe storms together in, uh, hold together at night, I guess, while losing the heating of the day? Uh, and Hayden kind of touched upon that a little bit. He talked about elevated instability. So sometimes the storms don't become what are called surface based, um, which is what, you know, we would expect kind of during the daytime. But uh, and during the night, and you know, especially during the summer, uh, you can get that low level inversion, but still a lot of instability, maybe a couple thousand feet off the ground and above. And that's how storms can kind of hold together um, and still produce damage even during the night. And uh, I guess a few years ago, we actually had a couple of nighttime tornadoes um move through the region as well and that's that's why the the instability uh was kind of a loft instead of based down at the ground uh question from john is there any indication that the frequency of severe weather is increasing over time either as a function of climate change or sunspot cycles um i don't believe there is um i know we are we do get obviously more severe weather reports than we did even 20 30 years ago especially the advent of you know uh, cell phones, social media, so we hear a lot more about it, and we're able to document it quite a bit more. Especially that's especially true for tornadoes. Um, but Hayden, I'm not aware of any research uh, that's shown any correlation yet. Not yeah, you know that that's very difficult because of the situation that um, nowadays we are able. We have the technology, the spotter networks. Um, to gather more reports than we've ever done before. So there is going to be more severe weather reported, um, but there's really no evidence that um, their severe weather has increased. Um, so that's a, that's a tough one. Right, I, I would say the jury is still out on that. Um, so yeah, but uh, good question. So that's obviously, it, that is something being looked upon by, uh, by climate researchers. A uh, question from Kathleen, does urban city development alter weather patterns? Uh, Hayden, you want that one? <laughs> Another climate <laughs> one. <laughs> That's, um, you know, it probably has a very small scale impact on, on that. I mean, there's, when, when we talk about scales, we talk about mesoscale and then we talk about micro scale, which is extremely small scale. And, even though we're talking about extremely small scale, it can have an impact on you know where storms develop and how how they develop. But um, you know we're not able to kind of utilize that technology is not there yet. It'd be like forecasting um, a thunderstorm, you know whether it's going to be here or two miles north of here in a day. We we don't have the capability. I, I will say though there is a myth that you know. A thunderstorm is going to weaken or intensify as it approaches a city. Um, that 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 is a myth. It, you know, it's more the environment that's in place that's going to um, impact. You know, tornadoes can go through a city; they can miss a city, but they don't really aren't usually utilized. It, that's not a big impact. Um, now, formation of a thunderstorm by very small um, microclimates, you know. That's hard for us to measure. Okay, uh, let's move it on. Let's see, a uh, question from Jeff. Most time a storm is coming from the west out of Enfield, uh, coming right at us here in Staffordville, then just before coming in, it goes around us. So why is that? And uh, that's probably similar to our first question about Worcester, uh, that storms always seems to either go around or uh, weaken and then strengthen east. You know, to some degree, it does have to do with the terrain. Uh, you know, some of the circulations, I guess, can be affected. Um, but Hayden, do you want to just kind of recap that first answer? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think a lot of it too is that, um, you know, with, with terrain, if you're going you know, down slope, there could be some a little weakening up slope. There could be a little strengthening if the wind's going up. Uh, but, but overall, you know, the, our terrains kind of, you know, we're, we're not dealing with big terrain here. So, um, the environment's, um, a much bigger player and also. Uh, the biggest thing I think where where a lot of people think that 
oh, the thunderstorms always weaken or go around me or miss me is because really the core of a, the worst part of a thunderstorm where you hear the wind damage or the large hail is usually very localized. And most areas are on the outer fringes of, of that. And they may get some wind and, you know, they may get, you know, some hail, but the real big hail and the real big wind is usually, fortunately, within a, a very, very small area where most people are, are lucky enough to escape it. If that's what they want. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Question from Henry on the topic of parameters. How is the great Craven Brooks parameter measured? Um, it's actually calculated. It's not a measured parameter. So and it's essentially just a combination of looking at uh, Cape and shear um, to kind of focus an area where um, potential severe weather could be. So it's really, it's a calculated parameter um, that's on the Storm Prediction Center uh, mesoscale analysis page. And if you go to that first, it's kind of a nice way just to kind of quick, you know, tell me what area should I really be interested in focusing for severe weather. Um, but that is a calculated parameter. I believe it's it's kind of a cape and, and shear uh, is what it, it uses. Um, question from Kevin, uh, what is the deal with thunder snow? Can it be severe? Um, I don't, it's a different process, Kevin. Uh, so thunderstorms during the summertime are what's called, it's, it's essentially upright convection, you know, uh, in the vertical, straight up and down. Whereas the thunder snow is, is called slant wise convection. It's unstable air being forced upon a, up a slope. Um, almost like when we talked about with a warm front being kind of a slope, but um, there's instability in this case. So uh, Hayden, I'm not aware of any severe thunder snow. I know we we had severe weather in the winter, um, the, but that's a kind yeah, of a different, it's, it's a different process. It, it's extremely, extremely rare. There may have been something I read about in March of 1984 in Massachusetts, I that there was some type of, um, you know, maybe a microburst, you know, snowstorm, thunder snow event. I, I, I don't have the details on it, but I, I, I'd say it's extremely, extremely rare. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question from Brian. Does spread work for calculating height of clouds like it does in the plains? And I'm assuming temperature and dew point. And yes, Brian, it does. Uh, so essentially, the, the greater the spread between the temperature and the dew point, the higher uh, the base of the clouds. Uh, and in fact, there's actually charts when we used to do weather observations to kind of help estimate the height of the clouds, we would take the temperature, take the dew point, match them up on the chart, and it'll give you a cloud base height. So obviously, if there's less of a, a difference, maybe three degrees, uh, your clouds are going to be lower than if your dew point temperature spread is 10 degrees. So that is a, that is correct. Uh, question from Bob, what causes a rise in moisture ahead of a cell on radar that also helps to weaken a storm, which is common in eastern mass east of 495. So a rise in moisture on radar. Do um, you have any ideas, Hayden? I, I think it may, maybe he's talking about, it sounds like more like east of 495, talking about more of an influence of a marine layer. Okay, yeah. Uh, coming in, that, that I, I, I think, and, and that's, you know, typical if you have, you know, especially early in the season, April, May, even into June, where you have, you know, south to southwest winds you know as you get back further you know west of 495 there's more of a you know land trajectory but as you get east of 495 you know getting pretty good gradient of wind off off the ocean which is you know can still be pretty cool as we know so um i i think that um might be what he's hitting at okay. in, in terms of um limit limiting your instability right Okay, question from Stephen. Didn't the SPC, uh, or its predecessor, the Severe Storms Forecast Center, used to shape its severe thunderstorm and tornado watch areas as boxes, polygons, parallelograms? It seems there's no obvious shape to watch areas anymore. Uh, that's true. Uh, now we actually do watches by county. So it's actually called watch by county. So the example I showed, uh, you know, from New Hampshire and Maine down into Massachusetts and Connecticut, um, they are, it's, it's issued by county. So um, it's close to an old polygon, like a parallelogram, but um, now we, we issue them by county. So either a county is in or a county is out. Um, back in the day, um, it was kind of drawn, you know, um, east and west of a line from point A to point B, which would usually be a parallelogram uh, in most cases. But uh, I, watch by county, Hayden, I believe that's, I mean, it's fairly recent, maybe, but it might be, you know, 10 years we've been doing it that way. Yeah, it's, it's, it may even be a little more than that. It seems seems like it's been a while. Yeah, so it's been around for a little bit while. But you're correct, Stephen. It's it's now it's watch by county. 
A uh, question from Michael. Why do some storms uh, today have almost no lightning, but a storm of the same size another day has millions of flashes? You want that one, Hayden? That's a good physics question. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Well, a lot, you know, uh, a lot of, in terms of, of lightning, um, you know, we basically you, you have, you know, the, the collision um, within the clouds. So the more instability you have, um, basically you're going to have, you know, more of those collisions and more lightning. So I, I would say like a, a situation where you have, you know, a, a lot of instability, um, you're going to have a lot more lightning um, in, in certain cases where the instability is low when you're dealing with more low topped, what we call low topped uh, thunderstorms. I mean, you, you may have a little lightning, um, but it's not, you, you just don't have the mechanisms, uh, the physics there to produce the, you know, a lot of lightning that you do. Say, you know, with thunderstorms you get in Florida and, um, you know, those, those mechanisms can be different than, um, you get necessarily with severe weather. Um, a lot of Florida gets a ton of lightning. They don't have the frequency of severe weather that you do out in the Midwest. Okay, good, good question. Uh, just a few more. We still have actually a lot of people on. And um, once we're done with this, if you want to hang around, Hayden, I'll do a quick briefing as to what's going on. Um, I haven't really looked at the radar since we started, but we will. Uh, question from Toby. Why, does, why doesn't heat lightning make sound? What is heat lightning? Um, this is a, actually a common uh, probably misconception. There really is no such thing as heat lightning. What you're seeing is lightning from a very distant thunderstorm. And it's at night, so the dark sky allows you to see the lightning from a farther distance. So it's most likely from a storm that's more than, say, 15 miles away uh, in the distance. Um, but it's being at nighttime, um, you're able to see it from a, from a greater distance. So that is what heat lightning is. Uh, let's see. Few people saying, "Oh yeah, May 31, 98. Everyone remembers that. Um, let's see. Boom. Oh, question from Jimmy: What equipment is put on a weather balloon to help determine severe weather? Um, it's actually, Jimmy. It's um, it's just a standard instrumentation package. So it's as the balloon goes up, it's measuring temperature, dew point, tracking the wind, the pressure. Uh, humidity, all sorts of those things. And from having that sounding like we showed, uh, that's how we can determine the potential for severe weather. All those indices can be calculated from those simple observations. So good question. Oh, my friend Fred says it's thundering in Newton as of 805. Okay, there we go. Uh, let's see. Colin wants to know about other webinars. So uh, marine weather. Yes, we actually, we did one already, Colin. If you go to our YouTube page, it is posted there. Uh, let's see. Some people are reporting thunder. There we go. I got uh, thunder here in Westboro. Okay, so uh, question from Katie. We'll wrap up with this one. Um, are the same instruments on a weather balloon as on a drop sonde? I believe they're similar, Hayden. Do you know the exact, is it the same instrumentation package? Yeah. Drop I don't sonde know used for hurricanes, essentially. Exactly the same, but um, they're pretty similar. They're, they're, you know, taking the same type of information. Right, right. Okay, and so we're gonna we'll do a quick briefing. But just before um, we get to that, I just wanted to obviously thank everybody for attending. We still have a very, a very pretty big crowd hanging on this long, and and thank you for staying with us. Uh, we really try to want to answer all of your questions. Again, this is being recorded. It'll be in our YouTube page uh, probably tomorrow if you want to go back and, and review the questions. But um, if you want to provide feedback, you know, tell us what's good, what's bad. Uh, maybe there's something you don't understand. You have a question we didn't get to answer. Um, or if you have suggestions, you know, we're, we're here for you guys. So um, you can email me. That's my email address. It's also on your webinar confirmation. Um, and I do get back to everybody. Sometimes it takes a day or two, depending on how much feedback we get. Um, but we certainly um, welcome your feedback and, uh, and comments. Let us know how we're doing.